Hello, welcome to the special audio commentary track for Assault on Precinct 13. My name is Michael Felsher, I'm a DVD producer and filmmaker, and I'm very happy to be here today with Mr. Tommy Lee Wallace, who was the film's art director. He also did the sound effects editing, as well as some other duties we're going to find out about as we talk. Uh, how are you today, Tommy? Very well, Michael. Thank you. So, why don't we just get right into it? Uh, when did this... Talk about the origin of this film and how you uh, got involved. Well, let's see. Somebody else is going to be better at pinning down the exact dates. I'm not so good with that part. But uh, John and I go back a long, 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 long way. Mm. Uh, back to grade school, really. Uh, and we became really close friends in high school as teenagers. And we were in a rock and roll band together. I think I had some, some uh, influence over John and where he finally chose to go to film school. For him, film school was a reality from the get-go. He was going to be a film director right from the start. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I took him over to the library in our hometown I, uh, on the campus of, uh, of Western Kentucky University in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and uh, showed him this blue book of colleges. And very quickly, he sort of honed it down to New York University or uh, Miami or uh, a couple of colleges in Southern California we all know about. Uh, and when it was all said and done, he, uh, he chose USC. Mm -hmm. And I followed him out after I finished college in Ohio uh, and went to USC also. I was sort of coming in as he was going out. And his first feature came out of that student experience. Uh, it was called Dark Star. Right. And I helped out. Coming out of art school, I was helpful to Dan O'Bannon on uh, various tasks pertaining to uh, set work and all on, uh, <clears throat> on Dark Star. So John turned to me later uh, when uh, Assault on Precinct 13 came along. as a, uh, you know, a... a very low budget film, uh, independently uh, financed, and uh, ah, here we have what the massacre of uh, <laughs> the the sort of United Nations of gang members. <laughs> the, Everyone's uh, well represented here. A, a, a fantasy, if ever there were one. Uh, <laughs> anybody who's uh, familiar with uh, how gangs break down is a they're pretty severe uh, in terms of their uh, segregation, so we say the, the separation of the races seems pretty pretty set. <laughs> but anyway, it, uh, it certainly worked for the story. Um, anyway, to finish off that story once and for all, uh, John invited me along for the ride on this one. I was fresh out of film school, and... Uh, uh, with lots of good help from an outfit called Get Set, I uh, put together the main set, which really was a lot of uh, of the movie. We we shot an enormous amount in that set. It's a multi room set, plus the basement. And uh, it, it, the the thing about the post production part was I was fresh out of film school, so. It was, I was accustomed to following a film all the way to the finish. So, uh, you know, when we got it shot, and it turned around, and now John's in the cutting room, and I don't have anything to do. And I was really feeling out of it. So I said, <laughs> hey, give me something to do. And he looked me in the eye and said, can you cut sound effects? And I went, sure, without really knowing what that job entailed. But like it was with art directing, since I didn't know what the official parameters of the job were, were I tended to do too much, right. which doesn't hurt the film a bit. No, no. Uh, I, you forget about sleep, but it doesn't hurt the film at all. This is down in Watts. Uh, it's funny how even in Los Angeles, it was hard. It was kind of a challenge to find places that looked desolate in California. Even, even rough neighborhoods kind of have palm trees and sunshine, and <laughs> most of the houses are sort of tidy even if they're tiny little bungalows and so uh it was a challenge to find places that felt like they were really burned out and uh and rough in uh, southern california but there are a few pockets uh 
down in Watts and other places. Right, here they are. The United Nations. <laughs> what studio did you film at? Where were all the sets built at? It's a place called, uh, it's now called Raleigh Studios. Then it was called Producer's Studio. Uh, and uh, it's right across from Paramount, uh, uh, kind of in the heart of things. And it, it, it's fraught with uh, all sorts of ghosts from uh, the early days of Hollywood. I think that's where they shot the Little Rascals and uh, some of those early efforts. And, uh, you know, uh, it's kind of moldy and uh, uh, dusty, but certainly got the job done for us. And uh, it, w the first experience at that studio had been in uh, on... Uh, Dark Star, mm -hmm. uh, which was a weekend project, if ever there was one, you know, <laughs> out the back, out of the trunk of people's cars and uh, uh, sc scotch tape and chewing gum, uh, and uh, so we were familiar with producers and John, uh, you know, once he's once he's in the groove on a place, unless it lets him down, he'll keep going back. Yeah, and if it so, works, you know. Why mess with what works? Exactly. You don't don't fix it. This is right over in East Hollywood, up a. I still use that street for a shortcut to get out to Pasadena. <laughs> That's our lead, Austin Stoker. Oh, Austin, yes. What was it like? What are your memories of working with him? Well, he was a good-natured guy. I, nobody. You know, when you work on a low-budget picture, you don't know what you're in for. Uh, yeah. Even now, if you come into a, a show, you just don't know whether this is going to be a forgettable crapola experience or if this is, like, going to launch you into stardom. And so uh, he had, uh, I think he and John developed a real good working relationship right away. And uh, he was, uh, you know, very reliable, always prepared easy to get along with. Good guy. Stand by. Oh, hey, I just heard my own voice. I'd forgotten that because, I'm, <laughs> because I was always in the cutting room and this continued through Halloween and other and some of my own pictures, I wound up uh, doing temp work for lots of voiceovers uh, in our own, uh, our own productions. And uh, sometimes it stuck, you know, I, I had a, a radio kind of announcer's voice that was real cheesy, you know, the kind of uh, overmodulated kind of thing, you know. <laughs> and uh, But uh, on occasion, it was something that John liked. Uh, and later on, I used it, hopefully, to humorous effect in some of my own stuff. Well, you are you're always there in the back. I mean, you were the, the voice of KAB. That's right. <laughs> The smooth sound, <laughs> the, the alter ego of uh, of the cutting room, I think. <laughs> well, that's one thing I wanted to talk to you about. I mean, obviously, with a lot of these early productions being very low budget and very, you know, just sort of down to the bone as far as resources are concerned. I mean, when you're on set, is it really a matter of everyone pitching in whenever they can? Well, the as a general rule, the division of labor was pretty well organized and everybody had their jobs to do. The, it, it wasn't just, I mean, I've seen some chaotic productions where everybody's just trying to do everything and right. it all just, everybody's always bumping into each other. Uh, it wasn't that uh, it was like that. It was actually pretty well organized, but people tended to have more than one job to do. Right. Uh, I, I just remember, especially on Halloween, as the uh, production designer on that show, and to some degree on this show, uh, I, I, I just wound up doing things like, okay, make, taking care of the cars, taking care of the locations, take, doing lots of jobs that I thought were my job, but it turns out later <laughs> it was like, oh, you mean they have a guy supposed to be doing that all the time? Mm -hmm. A location manager, what a concept, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, or a guy who takes care of all the cars and all the graphics on all the buildings and stuff, a separate from my job? Oh, wow. But my ignorance uh, made a better movie. When, you've, when you're when you on that uh, 
kind of budget and you're doing so many things, so many different things, you're saving enormous gobs of money. Right. And, but sometimes it's more than that. You're adding your personal touch or your personal vision that gives the show its own look that uh, is is anything but corporate. If you see what I'm getting. Oh at. no, absolutely. So, how much of what we're seeing throughout the course, certainly of this first portion of this movie, are are there any actual practical locations being used? No, uh, well, it's all practical so far. Oh, okay. Uh, we're in cars. We're on in neighborhoods. This is a practical uh, location. I guess this was part of the old Venice police station. Uh, we shot a couple of days down there uh which is still there by the way hmm. now this is this is some other generic place it's just a loading ramp uh, down in as i recall somewhere down in east la um but the like good low budget concepts everywhere this this one was founded on the idea that okay we're gonna we'll ramble around a little and get a sense of being outside and then as the movie closes down and becomes more confining, we'll get more and more into our set, uh, or our sets, I should say. Um, it, because sooner or later, you know, if you design it carefully, you don't notice it, but in fact, what happens is the money runs out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you just want to control that as much as possible. So this movie is very much, in many ways, a very, a, a very direct tribute to... The films of Howard Hawks. I mean, obviously, John Carpenter has a long, long-standing love affair with him and his work. Uh, Without question, John, I think, modeled his own directing style in many ways after Howard Hawks. Uh, certainly this one, we're talking about Rio Bravo here as much mm -hmm. as any other Hawks movie. Uh, a, a, a theme and an idea that Hawks remade several times himself, mm -hmm. uh, Rio Lobo, for example, and uh, maybe El Dorado was it uh, with Mitchum? My, yeah, I might have been. I'm drawing a blank at the moment, but yeah, it's it's a it's you know basically put a bunch of unlikely people in a room together with something trying to get to them. Yeah, and make a team a, a a team of unlikely people. Yeah, a see you know it's basically it's a very controlled siege picture, which John himself has done many many times in his career as well. Yeah, yeah, he loves he loves that that sense and. And I share that love of of uh, sort of the dirty dozen idea. Mm -hmm. is, uh, uh, in this case, it's more random than that. It feels more accidental. It's just random people. But uh, that idea of putting, well, the Magnificent Seven, putting people together for a team to achieve some goal, uh, whether the team is thrown together accidentally or thrown together deliberately, the the feel is similar. And it's just a delicious kind of excuse for a movie. Mm -hmm. That was uh, Darwin Justin back there and Tony. Oh, Tony. What's Tony's last name? Oh, Tony Burton. Burton. Yeah. <laughs> and two more characters here. Uh, yeah, it's fun. I, I think John has a, a really good, wicked sense of humor, which... Well, we share <laughs> growing up and growing up together as we did. That, uh, wow, there's the art van behind the... Oftentimes you have a trailer car. Mm -hmm. And here we have the doomed Kim Richards. Kim, Kim Richards, yeah. The, uh, that was pretty daring stuff. We're going to kill a kid? Yeah. A camera? Yeah, yeah. Shoot I mean, that's... this poor little girl? Wow. I'm hungry. You'd rather eat than get your nanny out of this, this horrible neighborhood. Well, I'd know what to say to her better if I had something to eat. Where is that street? I can never seem to find that street. And of course, she couldn't look more innocent and pure in this. I mean, she's got the pigtails. I mean, it's like, it's almost <laughs> like he, he went out of his way to make sure she was the nicest, sweetest girl in the yeah. in the universe. Yeah. And then we're going to shoot her like a dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can hear me chortling. And it is, it is, I suppose, kind of cold-hearted in the end. But, wow, you know, 
these are bad guys. This is the point. And we were giggling in the cutting room. It's like, oh, man, when he shoots the kid. Okay, he's a bad guy, and we're, we're scared now. Didn't have to do anything, by the way, to the, to this setting. I was it, just about was, to ask. This is what it looked like, pretty much. Didn't didn't have to bring any stuff. Didn't have to dress any stuff. But it was kind of like I said. It was a hard search to find. This was just a little pocket of uh, a few blocks down in Watts, uh, and the rest of it was, you know, modest houses to be sure, but tidy and nice looking little streets. It was it was a real lesson in what some sunshine and palm trees can do for a neighborhood. Well, this was also the beginning of a, a, of a love affair that John has had, and also with your films as well, with the anamorphic widescreen process of filming. John taught me uh, <clears throat> a lot about that. There were three areas where we, uh, th- this, we made this, for pennies and yet John insisted that we have the best lab in town which at that time was MGM Mm -hmm. and we had the best camera equipment with the widescreen anamorphic which was Panavision Uh, and the best sound treatment available which at that time was Goldwyn Studios so we worked our way to the Goldwyn mix with men uh, Bill Varney comes to mind he mixed our film for us later went on to win Academy Awards and stuff but Sam Goldwyn Studios was the Cadillac so we had Cadillac in all three areas and then we were like Volkswagen everywhere else (laughs) uh, faking it but the end result the first time we looked at our dailies which was on a bed sheet in somebody's apartment up on Beechwood Avenue uh I'm sitting there in the projector. It's going out, going onto the wall, and it just went on forever, this wide screen that just didn't quit. (laughs) And I thought, I sat up, bolt upright. I was so shocked. Um, There we go. First sign of some art direction. We got our own sign that kind of fits in with the building. Anyway, uh, I, I sat bolt upright. I was so shocked at how unbelievable it looked, it just looked like a million dollars. And I said, man, we're making a big movie here. Yeah. It has a very epic feel for a film that's actually as small as it is in terms of the locations and where, you know, the action that takes place, the shots that of LA and the the surrounding areas, especially in the opening part of the film, feel, they feel expensive, even if they're not. Yeah, and thanks to, to John's uh, shot making, his uh, setups, his blocking, and you know maybe thanks to s- some degree to this set as well. That's a tip of the hat. To, not to not to pat my own back, but to do as much tribute to uh, the guys from Get Set and the painters. Mm-hmm. Excellent, top flight set painters for this thing. That's a pretty damn fine set. Yeah, talk, were... talk to me about the design for the set because obviously you. With all the action that goes on here, you would have had to have done very specific things, and you had to have the. Uh, how closely did John work with you as far as where everything was going to be and how the action was going to flow through there? Uh, we just kicked it back and forth. Hey, big shout out to yep. my ex wife, Nancy. There she is. Yep. Uh, I, he, uh, he and I kicked it back and forth, and he had an idea of sort of the central area that mm-hmm. is the. And. Uh, as I recall, it was just a very free-flowing conversation between us to make sure we got plenty of areas for action. If you notice the big counter that goes all the way around, I think that was modeled after maybe a station that was out in, uh, May, like, uh, I don't know, uh, Monterey Park or somewhere. Uh, and it fairly carefully worked out in terms of, okay, when they have the big shootout, where are they going to hide, how's it going to be? Um, but John also gave me quite a bit of freedom because uh, I think he trusted me to come up with something that would, uh, you know, make some sense uh, aesthetically uh, and plenty of room to to uh, to play around back and forth. Um, the uh, things like having it be 
a big scale set. I, I mean, those were the big uh, nightmares and headaches was how big should we make this thing? How big can we make this thing? Right. How, uh, first, how, how big can we afford to make it? <laughs> but beyond that, um, well, for example, in the, in the wider shots, you've got to be careful if you're going to do a low angle, you might be shooting right up off the set so that you'll notice from time to time that, that it, when you're looking at a low angle, you'll be looking up and seeing a piece of the ceiling. So we needed mobile, uh, movable ceiling pieces made out of, as I recall, it was uh, cotton duck or muslin or something that was just in a smaller piece that you might slip over in one end of the set or on a corner <laughs> of the set, just, just so you could have a feeling of spaciousness, but still give the lighting guys what they needed. And uh, this is John's Lauren Bacall uh, idea. Mm -hmm. is, uh, I mean, he certainly, uh, it was Doug Knapp, uh, the director of photography, I think. Yeah, I and, wanted to uh, ask you about him because this was the only time that he was a DP for, for John in one of his movies. And I was well, wor I, wondering what that experience was like and what Doug was like. Uh, Doug was very meticulous, very conscientious, great talent, uh, uh, super lighting, uh, you know, uh, he was a classmate of John's, and so it wasn't like uh, John suddenly went out there and found a uh, uh, seasoned veteran or anything. So mm -hmm. we were all kind of learning at the same rate. Uh, I think after that, John just kind of ran into Dean Cundy, and that was a nice love affair there for many pictures. Yeah, yeah. One thing with this set that I wanted to talk to you about, and I'm always, always interested with whenever I talk to a production designer or art director, in, in terms of this set looks has to look like it's been there for a very long time. I mean, we're looking at the last days of this precinct. Yeah, everything's mm -hmm. run down. It's just kind of, things look like they're closing up shop and everything. So how, how hard was it to get an aged look for something that was, I mean, you're, you're supposed to believe this has been here for 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. Well, that's uh, as much uh, an issue of uh, a great, paint crew as anything else uh you certainly in all the props and everything you have to be conscientious about what you put together but uh it starts with the walls and the floor and the pieces uh, the, all that wood that's just cheap wood that's been uh, grained out and painted that way and then aged down uh, so a lot of it is just adding in if you look there i mean that looks that looks like it's been there a long time and yeah. it's been aged, uh, you know, just it layers and layers and layers of dirt and crud and stuff. And uh, that's just all painted on uh, yeah. for the most part. And that's uh, uh, the fabulous Gerard brothers, uh, Dick and Mike Gerard. I learned so much about art directing from those guys. Was there a, ever a situation where you were shooting in some of these neighborhoods? Did you have any problems with the uh, the locals in the area or the uh, people not, who were living down there? Not terribly. I mean, you'd have curious people, and every movie crew becomes aware of uh, their old tricks that somebody might hover close by and make a bunch of noise. And what they're angling for is a little payoff, so they'll shut up and go away. Uh, and that. We may have encountered a little bit of that kind of stuff, but uh, not not overwhelmingly so. It was pretty peaceful for the most part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this big giant, this big big giant <laughs> silencer on the end of this AR-15. It makes me laugh now. Well, the thing about the movie, and it's interesting because the, the reception critically, it was very well received when it came out, but there were people who were like, this isn't in who had a, a, some real issues with the violence, especially with some of the stuff that's about to come up here. Did yeah, it's, I find it. And I think you do as well. There's a, a really very strong black comic element to a lot of this. Well, yeah. I mean, it, the, John has a great sense of humor and he, he, he plays this stuff extremely well. I think first off you're making a low budget thriller, a, an action movie. So it's got to be, I mean, you know, right down to the, uh, Nancy, 
my ex-wife Nancy, you know, that T-shirt. Nancy was also doing costumes. Mm -hmm. So the the shirt, not T-shirt, the uh, shirt on the ice cream guy. (laughs) It's just like, it's so jolly, you know. Yeah, yeah. And it ain't jolly what's going to happen here. So uh, there's that. Oh, i got to give you a little note here about uh, the sound effects and dialogue cutting and stuff. Oh, sure, yeah. The guy actually says in the script... It's 8 o'clock, sweetheart. I'm closed. But to give you an example of the low-budget nature of this thing, when we got to that, John was really worried about it doesn't look 8 o'clock. It looks 6 o'clock. Or it right. does, you know, it's still light. And he asked me what I could do about it. And so I actually cut the guy's lines. So he said, it's late, sweetheart. I'm closed. We didn't have the luxury of a looping job or changing <laughs> his line. He was long gone, and we weren't about to be able to get him back unless we paid him more money, which we weren't going to do. Right. Here was a shout-out to Charles Cyphers, too, an eternal fixture in John's movies. And, uh, yeah, he looks good there, along with Darwin. Both of whom appeared in The Fog. I remember Darwin from the uh, the medical, the corner scene after the, the guy is found dead on the boat. Mm, that's right, that's right. <laughs> that's one thing about John on, on certainly on a lot of his movies he was very he had his own little repertory company going well yeah well you know once I I think the truth of the matter is just practically speaking casting is a tough process it's yeah. an agonizing process and I don't think John liked it any better than any of the rest of us do uh, you really have to be a sucker for punishment to enjoy the process it's just a necessary thing you have to go through to get the best actor for the role so if you've come upon actors you believe in it's really nice to to write a script and to be thinking okay yeah i'm gonna have chuck play that part you've you've already saved yourself several days in the casting office Mm -hmm. uh, just by doing it that way and uh, i'm sure john was was thinking that uh, all along the way it's nice to have a little ensemble and that's not unlike the john fords and the howard hawkses oh sure you'll see you'll see the same cadre of people show up in movie after movie because you know once you've made friends with people you enjoy working with them you know they're going to deliver the goods uh it just takes a lot of heat off of you a lot of weight off of you And Tony Burton, who that same year would appear in Rocky. That's right. So That's he right. Uh, he had a good year here. Yeah, this was he was happening. He's a good guy, Tony. Well, someone uh, a filmmaker I was talking to recently, and this applies certainly to this film, casting a lot of some of these veteran actors. In you know, you have a lot of situations that may seem implausible if you were handed to other actors. But you give them to some people who can bring gravitas to the ridiculous to a large it's degree. It's true. It's true. I, and a lot depends on the actor being able to sell it and uh, being relaxed on screen, convincing, so as they don't seem to be acting at all. They're just, they're just there. Uh, acting, God, my God, it's such a mystery how it works. Some people agonize over it and go through all sorts of gyrations to delivered the performance and other people just seem to kind of wander in and do it uh, in their sleep and yet it, it really for a director it's whatever it takes to get that good performance uh, to create an environment that's safe for this actor to do what they do oh boy here it comes <laughs> <laughs> she was so good she did such a good little performance oh she was great but i mean she did escape from which mountain for disney right around this time i mean she was a i think that's one of the reasons that she's uh, this scene so effective is you she's so believable and you really like her and you and the movie hasn't given away at any point here that it's willing to go to the extremes that it is well what no but what i was gonna say is uh when you're a little movie and you don't have that much of a budget to work with you have to make a little noise in some way you've got to raise some eyebrows in order to get some attention and i am sure that the 
it was a very deliberate act where John was concerned. Is he's going to be provocative here? It's going to get some attention. Love that shot. Look at that nice stacked up uh, telephoto shot. Yeah, just like a shark kind of. Did you have to put that phone booth there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just dropped it where we needed it. Can I get an ice cream? It's late, sweetheart. I'm closed. It's late, sweetheart. I'm closed. <laughs> <laughs> Did John ever express any regret either during this time or after about the decision to kill the little girl? No, I don't think he regretted it for a minute. I, if he got any sort of flack around it, mm -hmm. and I guess he did, uh, you know what they say, any publicity is is good publicity. And I think that's, oh, don't go back, girl. Yeah. Don't. Oh, no. <laughs> this is... Uh, well, if, I, this if is only John's... she had gotten the vanilla swirl. Exactly. This <laughs> is this is uh, John's sense of humor at work, or sense of irony, perhaps, is a better way to put it. So, yeah, your uh, your wife at the time, Nancy, was responsible for the costuming on this. How difficult do you, how much of it did you observe for her? How difficult was it to come up with some of these things? Well, I think she had about, you know, five dollars and 99 cents to work with so oh she had she any, had that much any <laughs> anything oh oh kim don't go back. don't do it don't do it just <laughs> be happy with the vanilla honey just don't yeah. do it oh jeez. <laughs> oh dear yeah Ooh. yeah little load up the blood in the back of the ice cream cone and blow it out with air was that how that and was done Mm -hmm. I was never 100. I, fi I figured it was something that was like a pella that was thrown against her, but I didn't realize how that. Then you had nice, the nice, simple trick. It was just a just a sh quick shot of air with a little bit of blood loaded up in the back of the ice cream cone. Yeah, <laughs> it's just like I sp I take one phone call and my daughter winds up dead. My daughter's oh no, my god. Um. Yeah, I think John's sense of irony and dark sense of humor uh, come into play here. And remember the rules. You've got to show that these are the meanest. These are the bad most, guys. <laughs> most horrible bad guys who ever walked the earth, and those are the rules. Well, the scene, I mean, obviously some people could say this is an exploited, you know, exploitative scene to have something like this, but this sets everything in motion for the picture. Yeah, and, and it's and, important. And I don't think uh, John was in denial about what kind of movie this is. It is an exploitation picture. Uh, that's that's sort of the assignment when you've got just pennies to make the movie, and yet you want to make a you want to make a movie that people want to watch and that have a good time, and it's big, sh you know, shoot 'em up kind of uh, kind of stuff at work. That's the uh, I, I I believe John would say proudly that he was making an exploitation picture. That was the name of the game, with a title like Assault on Precinct Thirteen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, although the original title was the Anderson Alamo. Uh, well, that's Anderson yeah, that's being, even more evocative of a Hawks Western. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Anderson being the I guess the the division of town or the section of town, mm -hmm. or whatever. But uh, it went from the Anderson Alamo, it was that for a while, then it became the Siege mm -hmm. for a while. And I believe it might have been Irwin Yablons who came up with Assault on Precinct 13, which I think is a great title. It's a great title, but I don't think it's actually, the number of the precinct is not number 13. <laughs> no. So it's like, not. it's like, okay. And isn't it funny how these things go? You know, nobody cares. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it does sound better than like assault on precinct eight. Right. You know, exactly. Thirteen it's just has a unlucky nice ring number, to it. of course. It's freighted, which is good. Yeah. And that's needless to say, that's the old uh, the old Venice police station there. All these exteriors around it. And that's still there. Yes. Mm -hmm. What is Down it? What Venice is it now? Uh, I see, I don't know, some kind of community thing pertaining to Venice. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure exactly what. Uh, but a 
I was just down there doing some post-production in Venice and driving by it every day, bringing back uh, fond memories. Basically, any movie with a budget this low, your memories are of an impossibly difficult job that you did and, you know, crappy food and all the rest. Right. Uh, so what you really enjoy is having done it. Uh, doing it at the time was really, really difficult and challenging. But the minute it's done, especially when the movie comes out as good as this one did, then you look back with sort of rosy glasses and say, wow, wasn't that great? <laughs> well, that is one thing. Yeah, that, I, a lot of filmmakers I've talked especially that have done low-budget films, they always tend to just remember the overall kind of, you know, they look through the rose-colored glasses at everything, and they don't remember the fact that, oh, yeah, this day we had to do 100 setups, and I don't know how, uh, how we didn't lose our minds. Yeah, yeah. And so typically on uh, movies like this, uh, lunch is McDonald's brought in, you know, right. and stuff like that. And, you know, although I believe it was Thanksgiving uh, when we shot down here at the Venice police station, I remember Deborah. Well, now with Deborah, let's see. No, Deborah was just the script supervisor on this one, so she wouldn't have been responsible for that. But somehow, uh, between Joe Kaufman uh, and Jonathan Kaplan, the producers, uh, and the production manager, who was, I think, John Serge Mackey and maybe Don Barons got involved. Anyway, among all of those people, they provided us with a Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, hey, there you that go. Dave, which was a big deal. <laughs> hey. I've been on a couple low budget shoots where you were just lucky to get a uh, couple sandwiches and a piece of fruit at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, or a bunch of pizzas. Or yeah, something. exactly. Something easy, cheap, and you can get a lot of. Yeah, yeah. Just to get you by. All this nice camera work, and John liked Dolly in the camera for storytelling purposes. He subscribes pretty much of the time to the school that says the director's job is to be invisible but to tell the story effectively so these moves aren't so much filmmaking I'm seeing these days is like a celebration of the director and how good he is at showing off uh, I don't think John subscribed to that school and as a result his films generally are just really effective storytelling I got some great sky work going on back there yeah yeah it's a nice little Nice little thing. You can count on L.A. to give you some very nice uh, backgrounds every now and then. Yeah. Now, when you were doing the sound effects work, and that was, like you said, something you just kind of raised your hand and said, sure, I can do that. And then it's one of the guy walks away and goes, okay, how do I do this? Um, there's a lot of gunplay in this movie, an extraordinary amount of gunplay. Yeah, so much of the budget probably went to... Uh, uh, you know, firearms and uh, armaments and all the rest, because uh, we did we did a lot of shoot 'em up and a lot of squibs, mm -hmm. a lot of blood packs, uh, a lot of blood actually. Uh, but uh, you know, that's why I'm saying that it's it's uh, I think it's an unashamedly exploitative picture. This mm -hmm. isn't trying to, you know trying to pretend to be something more than that it's uh it's about guys shooting at each other and <laughs> killing each other yeah <laughs> uh but at, because i uh i had great freedom didn't have didn't have some kind of great fancy studio to work in but what i did have was uh pretty much unlimited use of a uh of a nagra that which is uh was the state-of-the-art tape recorder at the time. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. And um, and I was in the cutting room, so I was side-by-side side with uh, with John on so much of this. I had the ability to originate a lot of these sound effects. I went first to Ben Burt, who oh, yeah, uh, yeah. was a classmate at USC, who later uh, made a name for himself around the Star Wars franchise with George Lucas. Uh, but at this point, Ben was still down at USC, and he worked in the projection room uh, 
projection booth, I should say. And uh, uh, basically every movie that came down there, he would uh, record for himself uh, the effects stem uh, of the soundtrack, Mm -hmm. which meant that he had gunshots and ricochets from all the famous movies. So he had this collection that he had really put together beautifully. It was like a little library. You'd hear Ben's voice and he'd say, Fox Ricochet, and then you'd hear, you know. And so going to Ben was my first good move because uh, he gave me lots and lots and lots of gun shots. So it's uh, pretty well articulated in that way. But I originate a lot of things like bullet hits. uh, Like if you listen carefully, you can hear certain bullet hits are uh, a a really sharp pair of scissors being Oh, really? being brought down and just making it up as I went along, uh, uh, getting good car effects by like riding on the hood of the car. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, You know, uh, again, because I didn't know very much, I did sort of more than one might ordinarily do. And in overdoing it, uh, I got it uh, into a place where it really worked well. Bill Varney, uh, after the mix, Uh, I brought him these sound effects. Typically what happens with a sound effects cutter is that they will bring an enormous amount of material to the stage and make quite a few creative decisions with the mixer and the director perhaps or anybody else who happens to be involved in making those decisions. Kind of on the spot, it's almost like auditioning. Right. A bunch of different choices or having enormous layers of this and that and the other. Well, I didn't have the wherewithal to do it that way, so I made the decisions. And on occasion, there might be an alternate, but for the most part, it was it was what it was, and it was very simple, uh, just a few tracks laid out. As a result, Bill said that uh, it was an, that one reason we got the good mix we did is because it was very simple. It was uh, a couple of dialogue tracks, the music track, a couple of atmosphere tracks, and, you know, five to ten sound effects tracks. And you that's unheard of for a movie this complex. It's its way too simple. And yet it came out good. Because uh, ha- not having so many tracks to try to figure out, right. he was able to get the best out of what we did have. Because they were right there in front of him, easy to follow and easy to understand. Because one of the most distinctive things I've always remembered about this movie is that the, the villains use silencers on their guns, so we don't hear the shots coming off. All of a sudden, there's just a bullet or a, a hole in yeah, somebody. Yeah, it's fun. It's kind of scarier that way. Was that kind of challenging to not have the traditional bang and then do something after that? If you listen very carefully, you'll hear some sort of excuse for a silenced weapon. It's not much, but it's like, you know, just just something. And then the real serious effect, in a way, it cleared the track for the the hit, Mm -hmm. the bullet hit, which was unique. It was all different and sometimes scarier, I think. Yeah, I agree. Because it it indicated a, uh, a, 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 a deadlier killer. You know, uh, there's trouble. Trouble is here, and it's sneaking up on you in a way. I think it added to that, to that effect. Yeah, the hits, the hits on the body. Oh yeah, here. Whap, whap. Yeah, very. They're very wet, very heavy. It sounds yeah. like it's like, it's like a baseball bat whacking a side of meat. Yeah, you know? and it's a it's a combination of several things, including that scissors snap I told you about that adds a lot of of sharpness to the whole thing and ricochets of various kinds of impact thuds it was fun to do it's a great education after film school oh oh just a great education I was in a lucky position and John was of course uh, hats off to him for taking a chance was it uh, on the set, how difficult was it to work with, who was in charge of uh, corralling and working with the weapons? Well, we uh, basically, for the most part, it was in my department. Hmm. I had a stalwart group of uh, 
they they were being paid but not very much uh you know randy moore craig stearns blake schaefer uh, and nancy quite a bit of the time when she wasn't in front of the camera she was she was in our group helping out because basically costumes were the way we structured it costumes fell under the art department so we were all doing these these mini jobs and this is this is one of those action sequences that i think john was struggling with and uh at, at, i i had some ideas and so he let me run with those and i think that's what led to my gig on halloween as being the editor because when he saw that i could handle action sequences like these mm -hmm. i think he said well all right you know this is <laughs> this is easier than <laughs> trying to cut my own footage was it uh, I have to wonder because I mean John Carpenter is known for being you know being having a very distinctive style and being very much in control of his films what was he what was it like with him as far as seating control sometimes saying hey maybe you can do this better than me was that was he was he easy enough to work with in situations like that well I, I don't think I was ever any kind of threat to him so uh, we go back a long way there's a lot of trust mm -hmm. and uh you know, maybe I had an easy, tactful way of making these suggestions, but, uh, you know, it uh, it never seemed to be much of a problem. So you actually did work as an editor on this film in some of the sequences, so if you could talk a little bit about the challenges of cutting together. It's like the scene we just watched with all the bullets flying around and everyone's ducking oh, for a, cover. It was a blast because when you've got that much coverage... And if you noticed, or maybe you didn't, and if you didn't, that's good. But we got so much accomplished with nothing more than paper flying in the air. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it 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 gave it a sense of chaos. Uh, but there was there was plenty of detail work there that uh, helped get us through. Uh, it was a joy. It was just uh, it was fun to let it rip and. Uh, uh, and I think John enjoyed watching his stuff. Uh, I, maybe I took it one modest degree beyond where he had taken it. And I uh, think he enjoyed seeing his material stretched out a little bit. Were you able to edit the film during production or did that have to come afterwards? Oh, it had to come afterwards. I, think about it. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a pre-digital day, so there's really no way you could have, I guess. Deborah Hill was the script supervisor but she was also the assistant editor uh, uh, in terms of dailies uh, getting dailies synced and filed and sorted and so it really was a process that had to wait till we had the film in the can mm -hmm. uh, because the editor of course was the director uh, the editor of of record was John and he certainly couldn't be trying to cut this film while he was directing it. That would have been too much. Right. So it didn't really get underway until post-production. Uh, you know, there was no cutting. Uh, just getting to watch dailies on a regular basis was a, a big enough deal. Yeah, that's true. People, It's so easy for people these days to just think, oh, yeah, just play back the tapes and blah, blah, blah. But you didn't have that luxury back then. No, it uh, was a more intricate... Uh, 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 process and uh you know with digital something's lost and something's gained as Joni Mitchell would have said mm -hmm. do you think if you were to make this movie now do you think it would be as effective or do you think that it was very much a product of the time in which it was made gee I don't know uh so much so much action has gone down I think as a general rule uh, film action is being handled differently by a different generation of of directors. I think an awful lot of them come out of commercials mm -hmm. or out of uh, music videos where uh, they rely awfully heavily on fast cutting right. and a sort of sense of disorientation. I think that's something that's lost. Now, there may be some gains that have been made just in terms of spectacular action. But uh, the, the, it's easier for me to address what's been lost, and that is a sense of real storytelling in the in the middle of action. Yeah. Uh, the most action sequences now, to me, are are just 
big, splashy, disorienting things that don't actually add up because directors tend to forget about stage lines or any any of the technical aspects of directing that keep track of who's where and stuff like that. That's, right. That feels like it's been mostly thrown out the window. Well, I agree, and that's that's one of the things I find remarkable about, about this film as well as many of John's other pictures. You always know where everybody is, what the location is. You We've gotten to know this location extremely well. And yeah, by now. And, and that's the power, of course, of the setup and the kind of the establishing of all the, the comfort zones and how it is with warm lighting on it so that when you change it, you've been there a while. You've, you've lived in it and you know some of the nooks and crannies and you know a sense of safety. Well, that's gone. Right. Now it's dark. Now it's scary. Uh, but without realizing it, we know where we are at all times now. We've seen the set. And that's a very important piece of storytelling. It you is. Know, a facet of storytelling. If you get the need one of the one of the really important aspects of John's films, right from the start, John was in complete control. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons he got to make some of these films was because he could offer his services and a finished film kind of really cheap, really mm-hmm really for not very much money and the price he asked in return for doing it that way was all right but i have final cut right right. i have complete control and that meant you never ever had to look over your shoulder and wonder if this was going to be okay with the studio Mm -hmm. or if uh, the sponsors were going to be second guessing you you didn't have to trouble yourself with any of that stuff which meant you could focus entirely on carrying off one man's vision. Uh, And that man, of course, like good directors everywhere, uh, knew enough to funnel the talents of all the other people who were along for the ride. Right. Uh, But in the end, it it came came down to one man's vision. And that's, that's when you can get some really good stuff. Uh, when you don't have to do it by committee. So much filmmaking now, I feel, looks and feels like it's been done by committee. Yeah, I was uh, uh, another filmmaker I was working with recently, commenting, told an old joke, and said, what's a camel? It's a horse designed by committee. Yeah, exactly. And that's what filmmaking, unfortunately, ha- especially with major studio filmmaking these days. Yeah, it. I mean, look, when you commit... If I, I, I see how it is from a studio executive's point of view. It, if you commit $200 million to a picture, right? you got a lot of nervous people oh, sure. running around, and they generally don't have enough to do to justify their massive salaries. <laughs> and so they're going to weigh in, uh, and they're going to try to do their best to make it good. But... Everybody trying to do their best to make it good all, oftentimes means too many cooks are going to spoil the broth. Right. Now you had, the so the film, is. how long did you shoot? How long was the shoot on this? Well, it seems like, I think it was 24 days, uh, probably about four weeks. Mm-hmm. May, it might have been a few more days than that. Maybe we shot some little extra something. Something that John taught me from almost the get-go was try and build in a little extra pickup time for inserts and oh by the way and oh gee that didn't work as well as we thought maybe we could shoot this little thing over here Uh, that certainly uh, that certainly uh, played out uh, in um, uh, the fog Uh, oh sure you know low budget movies have to move incredibly fast uh, in shooting And oftentimes there will simply be things that get overlooked or or there's just not enough, just not enough time. So to have already built into the budget and the schedule that you're going to go back after two or three weeks in the cutting room and do a little bit more shooting of controlled situation, little inserts, little action pieces and stuff, 
It's just a good. There goes that 357 Magnum from <laughs> Dirty Harry sound effect. I, I think bet. Yeah, that's that's a loud brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the the uh, was this film when you got into editing? Was it pretty much in fighting shape, or did you have to go back and add in a few things or change anything? I'm trying to remember. It seems to me that that prologue with the United Nations of or maybe there was a mass. First, it was they got shotgun, didn't they? Mm-hmm. Uh, the bad guys, some of the bad guys, and that started that provided some tension. I can't remember whether that. Uh, um, I can't remember whether that uh, little sequence about the bowl of blood and the the United Nations thing. Mm-hmm. I cannot remember whether that was an afterthought. Um, or whether we shot it on schedule. Honestly, just don't remember. Ouch. That looked pretty good. The old breaking arm trick. Because on the... um, And it says a lot about Carpenter as a filmmaker, and I think he also went through some similar situations on the thing where he had to kind of course correct at a key point. On the fog, you had the film largely finished, and screened it and he said no we need to do better it that was a huge teaching moment for me uh i learned a lot about courage oh here's the old uh toss the shotgun shot <laughs> one of the favorite uh there favorite you go kind of boom, boom. Oh. Mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> uh john displayed enormous courage the fog was the same entire crowd that did Halloween right. was along pretty much for the fog. All the credits were the same. So you would have to assume this is just going to be an outright winner. But when uh, I cut it together first time in the cutting room, just it was like cut after cut, just bounced. It didn't quite work. It it That movie had a hard time coming together yeah. for, for like, magical reasons that you just can't figure out why it's just the nature of film but uh we did put it together and uh watched it with a small sort of family and friends group and john stood up afterwards and we were all thinking the same thing it was like well we're tired Mm -hmm. and we've just absolutely you know just exhausted had enough of it so we were all ready to say well it's good enough Mm -hmm. um and it wasn't bad but john stood up and said you guys this is okay but it's just okay and in the end it's just not good enough we're gonna have to tear this down and start again and man, that, that took some guts to say that. I, and, it does because I mean that's a, essentially admitting, hey, I, as a director, I'm not, I didn't do my job, but we got to go back and figure out how to fix this thing. And in in a record time, like um, it all happened within within like four weeks. Wow. Uh, John and Deborah did some rewriting, new scenes. Uh, I designed some a couple of little set pieces for us and uh, we did some location work all of that stuff in the prologue of the fog where there's little earthquake things happening and And the lights and all that yeah uh, that whole sequence plus some inserts uh, of ghosts Anytime you see a single ghost in the fog, it's me. Mm-hmm. And John is behind the camera. Some of the time it was just the two of us. Like Dean, I remember one night, Dean set the lights and we had the fog machine there. <laughs> and uh, But he had to go. So it wound up being really like student filmmaking. John was operating the camera and I was out in front of the camera doing the fog, foofing the fog and then standing up and looming toward the camera as one of the ghosts. <laughs> And that really was was cool. It was cool basic filmmaking, but it made the film so much better. Um, it, it finally came together. John wrote a whole new score for that redo. Uh, he didn't like the score that he'd written for the first try. And uh, 
just tore it all down and did it again. It's, uh, that's a big lesson to learn uh, about how you succeed is you really have to be unafraid. And I would imagine that's not a luxury that most filmmakers would even have the option of having these days. Well, I suppose it happens. I should think it happens from time to time. I know John had to go and kind of offer his head on a platter to, I guess it was Avco Embassy right. at the time, um, for the privilege of going on and shooting some more with a little extra money. I I don't know what he had to give up. It was probably some financial interest in the back end or something. Mm-hmm. But uh, he he made whatever sacrifice he needed to make to, to get the movie he wanted. Uh, and that's commitment. That's, uh, well, that's, we should have a moment of silence for your... Oh, yeah. Your, your departed. R.I.P. R.I.P. Nancy. Yep. Collateral damage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And and costumer, my God, from here on out, no costume. <laughs> yeah, you're you're killing off your crew here now. Yeah, so you've got to be careful now. <laughs> this film, how was this film? I mean, obviously, the it's easy to see why John would want to write something like this. It appeals very much to his uh, his interest. But coming off of Dark Star, was there heat on him as a director? Was this easy to get financed? And how did the producers come in? to be involved in this? One of them was a classmate. Uh, Jonathan Kaplan was a classmate of John's down at USC. And uh, I think maybe Joe Kaufman, the other investor, uh, came to the project by way of Jonathan Kaplan. I'm not sure. But, uh, you know, so many things like that happen because of some old friend you know, mm-hmm. it, the story seems to be repeated over and over again. It's, oh, well, that's that's an old school friend, or that's my college roommate, or whatever. Um, obviously, some things come right in the front door in the time-honored tradition of Hollywood, where, okay, your agent calls and has this script, or your agent get, sells something of yours. But more frequently, I think, it's because of somebody you know you bump into in the parking lot that these these deals get made um and that's that may be the way it is in all businesses for that matter yeah so was the what was the hardest i mean when you think back on the production what days were the hardest for you and what aspect of working on this film was the most challenging i know for john i'm pretty sure he would say that stuff in the jail because mm-hmm. that was that was those were long shooting days, or that was a long shooting day, and I remember he was sort of buried in there, and there wasn't much room, so the rest, most of the rest of us were, were not even in there. We were just outside, running, running supplies in when needed, and doing what we could from a distance. For me, uh, I'd say all the action stuff in the main set was probably the most challenging. It had me running around the most because every time we'd do a new setup, you you know, you might have to like, oh, that wall now has to be before the shooting started. So right. we're going to have to jump in here and repaint this and make it look like it used to be. Uh, there was a lot of that. Just uh, the kind of practical thing you run into when you're doing a shoot 'em up yeah, I imagine continuity had to be a pain in the ass on this one. Yeah, yeah, because, I mean, really, once you shot the place up, you didn't <laughs> yeah. want to have to go back too often. So was the movie largely shot in sequence? Yeah, I, you know, there are exceptions, uh, but uh, it's helpful to the actors when you can stay in as much sequence as you can, especially when so much of it relies on intensity of looks right. and uh, reactions. It's not a stage play, so there's a minimum of dialogue, really. Uh, so, as I recall, it was done fairly much in sequence. Things fall out of sequence from time to time, and everybody rolls with that. But uh, certainly, once we were in the set, you could stay in sequence uh, pretty much at the time. Also, since you have actors leaving the film at periodic points, you don't want to keep bringing them back for a day here, a day there. Well, no, that's deadly, too. Uh, I mean, you do have to have that very carefully planned out. Uh, you can't just suddenly, oops, we forgot about this. You have to 
you, you have to spend quite a bit of time mapping that out carefully. You can drop an actor for several days and then bring them back. That's mm -hmm. called a drop and pick up. But you, you really need to have planned that out very, very carefully. And that's where the first assistant director and the production manager come in. That was a question I had about the transition from something like Dark Star, which was essentially a student film, which became much bigger than just a standard student film. Shot, yeah. I imagine, like you said, on weekends, it was much more of a kind of a, a long form project in a way to doing yeah. a film like this, which is much more, even though it's an independent film on a shoestring budget, has a much more structured feel. It does have to have a production manager, a shot list. You know, oh, yeah. Was, there, was that a difficult transition for you guys to make, or did you, were you able to handle it well, pretty no, easily? Well, I, no, I, I think everybody was gung-ho to be there uh, because this is a real movie. Dark Star, like you say, it was, a, it was a weekend project, an extended kind of weekend project, student film style. Uh, didn't have any of those things. It was just basically John and Dan making it up as they went along, mm -hmm. uh, Dan O'Bannon. Uh, whereas this was, this had a pre-production process and a, a plan, intense planning stage, and then uh, we cranked it up and got all the equipment together and went and shot it. Uh, and uh, that was thrilling. I'm sure it was thrilling for John and, and maybe terrifying too because this was his real test mm -hmm. of being prepared and... Uh, knowing what he was doing at all times, all the things the director's expected to do. And uh, and he acquitted himself, as they say, he acquitted himself beautifully. He was always ready and uh, very decisive and more de kind of tellingly like good directors everywhere. He wasn't so dogmatic about it that he wasn't ready to hear a good idea. Right, he, uh, right. He, you know, he was pretty open about suggestions and and all that. It's funny because I know Dark Star technically is his debut film as a director, but when I watch this movie, I have always, for some reason, viewed this as the first John Carpenter film. I think that's fair. Uh, Dark Star was so much more a, a partnership between John and Dan O'Bannon, mm -hmm. a collaboration. It has just as much of Dan in it as it does of John, and one could even argue that the sense of humor in Dark Star might be more Dan than John. Mm -hmm. uh, it, and so I, I'm inclined to agree with you. This, in a way, is John's real debut uh, as a director with, well, also having all the tools at his disposal to, to I think maybe there was a crane on one day. There certainly was a dolly the whole time. Sure. And uh, so he could construct the shots he wanted uh, pretty much the way he wanted to do them. Um, and yeah, I, I think you have something there, Michael. It's a re I mean, it's such a remarkably assured film. It Indeed it is. Yeah, this is John, John still very young and uh, pretty inexperienced but so certain, so sure of himself. Um, and I, I think that I'm sure when in doubt, all he had to think about was, well, now what would Howard Hawks do in this situation? Here we go with the, uh, <laughs> speaking of Howard Hawks. Yeah, there you go. You, the know, <laughs> you know how to whistle, don't you? Yeah, I'll just pucker. I mean, really, this, this she's a very Hawksian lead for this, Lori. I mean, she's... Yeah. Uh, it was a very interesting choice here, and uh, again, I just uh, it's it's interesting. I guess we should just digress for a second just to talk about. It. I'm curious if you did see it, uh, the remake of the film from 2000, I think five. I did not. Uh, it, it's funny these these remakes like uh, oh gosh, Halloween, and the fog, the, and the fog assault, and. Uh, I guess there are plenty of others if yeah. one digs. Still out at the fourth quadrant from Warren to Vermont. Hey, that's my voice again. <laughs> you're always there, man. <laughs> you're, you're, you're always, anyone oh, turns on a radio, it's going to be Tommy Lee Wallace. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny to hear that. Forgotten all of this stuff. But uh, let's see, where were we? With the remake of the... 
Oh, yeah. Everybody, I guess, comes up, you know, when I go to these conventions, sure. weekend conventions and things, and they well, what do you think of the new Halloween? Assuming that I care. And honestly, yeah, yeah. not to sound snotty about it, but I couldn't care less. <laughs> yeah, We'd made, yeah. We made this movie, and if it, you know, if it was like, if I'm flipping the channels and it were to pop up, I'd watch with interest, but not enough to go out of my way to go pay money, go see the movie. Uh, it just, we did a good job. I like our mo- our version. I'm mm-hmm. not that curious about the new version. <laughs> yeah, I never, I mean, I always feel awkward even bringing it up because I never want to assume that, of course, the people who made the original would want to rush out to see what someone else is going to make of the same material. Mm-hmm. Um, especially yeah. since most yeah. of these remakes are not start the the, the uh, origin of them is mostly as a hey this is a brand name let's cash in on that let's cash in and that seems to be for the most part the way they turn out i i i believe i judging from what i hear at these festivals i think uh rob zombies uh halloween has a, a big bunch of fans mm-hmm. and apparently it succeeded on its own terms uh but it seems like some of the other ones might not have fared as well, and maybe they were just more calculated for the money or something. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to be too cynical, but at the end of the day, I, all I'll say about the remake of The Fog is I I don't think there was any creativity that spawned that mm-hmm. remake. And uh, I enjoyed the Assault remake for what it was. It was actually fairly well done, but it didn't. it wasn't even a patch on this movie. Uh-huh. Um, it's funny, though, in a weird way, John, we kind of, I don't want to say he remade his own film, but when I watch Ghosts of Mars, I am reminded of this film. Well, it's it's Assault on Precinct 13 on a train, isn't it? It's on Mars, that, basically. That's, it's, yeah, that's, it's, one of the, that's one of the ones I, of John's that I haven't seen. I, I think I saw a piece of it, like maybe it was on TV or something. But uh, I, I only saw enough to be able to conclude that it was kind of Assault on a Train. The, the Mars part, of course, is goes without saying but that's kind of assault on a train Mm -hmm. (laughs) somehow yeah i think he loves that theme and he uh, you know he's done it several times in in various forms well even halloween i mean you put people in a house with something trying to in a confined space with someone something trying to get to them the fog ends that way yeah Um, surefire uh, entrapment you know the thing was actually an inversion of that. They're all trapped, but the threat's not coming from the outside. It's inside. Yeah, it's inside. You know, yeah. So he's. Uh, it, it's always fascinating to watch a director who has, and I, 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 I wish there were more of that these days, of, of directors who have themes that they really love exploring and have a, a real point of view on. Yeah. And that's ra- it seems as rare these days with a lot of the up-and-coming filmmakers. They're just in it for the visual flash and not so much the storytelling or exploring any sort of aspect of humanity. Well, it may be an, an attention span issue. Like, you know, once they've done a thing one time, they're done with that. They want to move on to something completely different. Uh, as opposed to if you, yeah, generation two, three ago, you start noticing directors who have gone back to the same themes again and again. I, John's certainly not the only one. Mm-hmm. During this time, and obviously through Halloween and the fog, I mean, were you sort of absorbing in all you could with the intentions of being a director at this point, or did that ambition not come till later? Well, by this point, I had gotten out of film school and gotten a taste of directing while I was there. Mm-hmm. I I had a, I guess you could say, successful career in film school as a as a writer director. And uh, so I knew I was going to give it a try sooner or later. I, it, my entire being, I was, I was looser than that about it. Uh, I was kind of a hippie and wasn't taking any of it all that seriously. Uh, very loose. But uh, I did figure that down the line I'd be giving it a try. And so uh, I wasn't taking for granted what I was learning by watching how John conducted himself. What appeals to you as a director? I mean, we've talked a lot about John, but since these were sort of your formative experiences as well, what kinds of themes and, and, and ideas appeal to you as a filmmaker? 
Well, I'm probably, I can probably best sum up the difference between myself and John with an example from El Diablo, which is a Western he and I wrote together that eventually was made for HBO. With uh, Anthony Edwards? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. I was actually enjoyed that. Yeah, well, it was to be, uh, when John was going to direct it, this was going to be the Star Wars of Westerns. It was it, it was a really cool script, and mm-hmm. the basic premise was a time-honored one in, in Western lore about a young man whose sister gets kidnapped and taken down across the border, and he has... he feels he must go after her but he's ill horribly ill equipped for this he's a school teacher and not much of a of a he-man or a cowboy or any of the rest um and so he puts together what a ragtag team of unlikely heroes Mm -hmm. cowboys who are rough and tumble and tough and killers uh and off they go to solve this problem but uh when we after after solving the problem, which involved the huge adventure of going down south and finding El Diablo's hideaway, which was a sort of Tortuga-like place in an underground cave with a castle built in there. Um, you know, it's a real fantastic kind of uh, fantasy western. Um, they do their thing, and they don't all survive, but uh, the people we love the most do survive, which involves uh, our our hero Billy Ray mm-hmm. and uh, this guy named uh, Millionaire Patterson, a black cowboy, before <laughs> even <laughs> before Mel Brooks thought of it, uh, <laughs> and uh, it it was uh, right at the right at the finish line to that movie. What I wrote originally was that when they come to the fork in the road, Billy Ray goes back home with his little sister uh he's gonna pick up where he left off and be a school teacher and all the rest Mm -hmm. uh but he he went back home and and uh millionaire patterson rides off into the sunset and john had the exact opposite feeling about the thing he goes back home delivers his little sister to can't remember who who he handed her off to but somebody who would give her you know good care and a Mm -hmm. home and he rides off into the sunset with millionaire patterson having been he he can't go back home in other words Ah. and i guess in thematic terms that is the essential difference between john and me and what touches my heart thematically since that was your original question in a form Mm -hmm was this idea of what makes a man, Mm -hmm. what is a man. Uh, And for me, real men go back home and put their lives back together again. Uh, I don't want a fantasy. I want want to talk about real people trying to make a better world uh, and not go off and be an outlaw. And so I guess that's it in a nutshell. Because one thing that I've always found interesting about your career is that you've had such a long association with John that did you find it difficult in a way to get your own identity outside of his at times? Well, I'm still working on that. Uh, <laughs> the <laughs> the pigeonhole that comes with, with uh, successful horror movie uh, ideas uh, is a deep one, and it's... Uh, the phone rings most often for horror projects. Sure. I, I don't recall anybody, you know, phoning me to do a love story or a or a romantic comedy. Um, and that's just, that's everybody's burden uh, in Hollywood. You get pigeonholed very quickly. You get typecast very quickly. Um, and uh, I'm still working on that. I've got, I've got, uh, I'm, I'm not quite through yet, hoping to keep going. And got some other stuff uh, to to haul out there and see if I can get it to uh, to go. Well, since it may not come up, I don't know if we'll ever do one of these for this movie, but I wanted to draw people's attention to a film that you did that most people maybe not, have not seen. It's actually a wonderful little coming-of-age story called Aloha Summer. 
Oh, thank you for mentioning it. It's a that was a good one. It was an almost good picture. It has a few flaws, but uh, it's got a lot of heart and uh, wonderful actors, uh, young actors, uh, a, a cool cast, and, and a cool idea too. Uh, you know, cross cultural stuff going on in mm -hmm. Hollywood and Hollywood in Hawaii in 1959 when it became a state. Yeah, I, I hope people can uh, get hold of it out there because uh, it's a pretty decent movie. Well, I know as if I when I saw your name on that's what drew me to it because I thought, oh, the guy from Halloween 3 is doing what looks like a coming-of-age comedy drama. And so I was attracted to it by that, and I got it. it was a very rewarding experience. And I know it's oh, not related you. to Assault on Precinct 13, but I, what the hell, I'm going to use this opportunity. To, people should check it out. It's just It's always interesting to see what film uh, other aspects to other filmmakers you know uh careers you know th other interests that they have and this was such an interesting sort of <laughs> little stop you know stopping point for you that you would do this movie at that point in your well, career I'm, I'm so pleased you noticed it michael not too many people mentioned that one yeah, it was it was a good little movie it was a really Thank good you. little movie and then you've so had here, i mean you've had an experience unlike a lot cuz you've gone back and forth doing You've done some television work. You've done, uh, you've written screenplays for you know for, for other films that other people directed, like Amityville Two was an early one, mm -hmm. um, and then you did, you know, one of the the highest rated miniseries of its time and most well received was It, and that yeah, and I, I'll add uh, to toot my own horn. Uh, right after that was one called And the Sea Will Tell, which was a true, true crime drama. Uh, the book was written by Vincent Bugliosi about the Palmyra murders. Oh, that um, was uh, uh, Richard Crenna. Was, uh -huh, Richard yeah. Crenna, Rachel Ward, Hart Bachner. Um, I, I think that was a pretty good one, too. Uh, those were sort of back-to-back -back miniseries uh, during that time. So uh, what about what was it about these particular projects? I mean, what was it intentional that you were kind of saying, okay, I don't want to do, I want to kind of break away from horror for a while, or was it just absolutely. the way the path of your career at that point? I it absolutely was, and and those were followed by uh, comedies, um, suspense thrillers, little sci-fi, and even some uh, kind of family stuff. I did a I did a new version of Flipper, <laughs> a pilot for television, and a new version of Born Free, of all things, and that was when I was trying to. Uh, leave something for my kids uh, sure but and f ironically now of course they they really respect you know stuff like halloween and it that i did <laughs> they have almost contempt for the sort of flipper uh born free kind of stuff i was trying to do uh but that's <laughs> that's showbiz one thing I wanted to talk to you about was also your, your career now. What kind of films are you trying to uh, work on now, and what, what interests you as a filmmaker at this point in your career? I'm, I'm most interested in uh, a vision I have for a television show called Midnight Motel, which is basically a post-apocalyptic look at Los Angeles. Uh, if you could liken it to M.A.S.H., dark comedy mm -hmm. the way Ma the way mash was only not quite as as laughy and and that's fun and i haven't given up on horror by any means i think that's probably my best calling card still mm -hmm. and uh we've got two right now that we're trying to get off the ground one is called helliversity mm -hmm. um and we're raising the money right now for that and uh the other one is called scary land which is uh about uh some kids who come together to do a haunted house project. Yeah, now here's a fantasy that I'm not sure this is actually, actually, I, I guess this was borrowed from Jaws, the idea that this would blow up. <laughs> uh, this big tank of something. Yeah, well, J we, yeah, Jaws was out the year before, so... Maybe we helped kick off this notion of 
you know, if you shoot at something, it'll kind of blow up no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> I now I look at the Simpsons, and every time they like hit a garbage can on the street with a car, it blows, up. blows up. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, of course. This is a, another set right next to the other set, uh, the basement set. It's just a long corridor. Mm -hmm. And uh, sign was fun. I came out of graphic design school, so I was always ready, as was my my sidekick, Randy Moore. We were always eager to do do cool signs, you know, any chance we got. You mentioned uh, Craig Stearns, who also worked with you on uh, some of your other films as well. He went on to become a big time yeah. production designer as well. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I've got to, I've got to get in touch with Craig. It's been way too long. I'd like to, like to reconnect with him. Yeah, he's done some great work. Got to ask, were there any injuries on the film at all? Did anything ever go wrong? Uh, I'll tell you, there was a near miss, but way, way back there when uh, James Jeter, the the retiring cop and there was this box with a shotgun uh, in his office that thing went off uh, at the wrong time and it was just pure good fortune that it wasn't pointed at anybody because uh, I don't know how many of the listeners understand that just because a gun is shooting blanks well yeah, yeah. it it can still it can still be devastating. Well, look, I mean, I what happened to Brandon Lee? I mean, that wasn't... Exactly, you know. exactly. It's just blanks, but if you... Uh, Something if gets point, in there. If you're point blank enough, it can mess you up badly. And that went off very close to Deborah Hill. It could have hurt her badly. Uh -huh. I think, I think by and large, all the injuries were, you know, like like uh, bruised thumbs. From sure, right. All that banging, even with a rubber... A, a, a rubber. Yeah, you're stick. gonna you're gonna get sore eventually. You're gonna you're gonna get banged up a little bit here and there. Well, looks like they've just about done their thing here. These are fun scenes, the aftermath scenes. <laughs> everybody okay, looked every, horribly dead. Get and everybody all dusted up and uh, either dead or almost dead. Yeah. A lot of fog here. We were we were already <laughs> working with working with some fog. That's a nice reveal. It is a great really, reveal. That's I really like that. Was that shot in reverse? Actually, no. Really? I think that was uh, I think that was just the way it was. I, I, we had to do it several times, as I recall. I would have thought that was shot in just the way the, the fog actually gave a performance in that. <laughs> yeah, but think about it. Uh, you could put the fog in in reverse, but try getting the actors to do all that. Uh, That's true. Yeah, that would be all that very uh, hard. scene work. <laughs> not to not to say that we haven't done it that oh, way. Oh sure, uh, yeah. Adrian Adrian on top of the lighthouse did a little backwards acting. Uh, in her final moment with oh. the fog receding. Well, I've known that several would... actors who excel at backwards acting in a lot of horror films. They have to do a lot of stuff like that. Yeah. Yes, indeed. So the film's reception, I mean, it, considering that it was like a low-budget film, it was not something that critics would have been, you know, inclined to give a good review to for any reason. It got a lot of very positive notices. Well, it, it uh, as I recall, its initial, it, you know, introduction to American audiences was pretty underwhelming. But then it went to England and made a huge splash. It, it just connected somehow with the Brits. And then I think it rebounded back into uh, uh, the states and got a little bit of got a little bit more bounce off of that. Mm -hmm. But uh, initially, it didn't do much here, as I recall. I remember when we first went out on the night it was released and went looking. It, you know, it was pretty deadsville, and it was a little embarrassing too because. Unlike other movies, it didn't have a poster at the beginning. It was just like magic marker. <laughs> it was kind of, you know, it was a little bit embarrassing, a little bit of a letdown. But then it uh, it received its vindication not too long after that. John became a big star in England, and I think that made it possible to, to get other things done. 
So was it because of this movie directly that led to ha- him getting offered Halloween? Oh, you'd have to ask him about the chronology, but uh, I think that his star was on the rise and that he'd had a, a good enough experience with Irwin Yablons. I think that's the connection that mm-hmm. Irwin then started talking about a picture that at that time he was calling the babysitter murders. Right, right. And um, I believe that they kind of kicked that back and forth a little bit. And John may have just made him an offer he can't, couldn't refuse, like, okay, look, if you'll give me final cut, I'll do this for 50 cents, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, I think that might have been kind of how it did. So looking back on Assault on Precinct 13, uh, what place does the movie have for you personally and professionally now looking back at it? Uh, just deep affection for it. It was a real pleasure working with John and uh, so many other fine people on a project that uh, was uh, was pretty first class from start to finish. Thank you very much, Tommy. Thank you, Michael. The pleasure was mine.